Well, let's get right into it. It's a triple threat release from Funk Soul Icons, you know, Bay Area Royalty, Tower of Power. It's a DVD, double CD, and triple vinyl, 50 Years of Funk and Soul, live at the Fox Theater. It's coming out March 26th. You pre-save, pre-download, go pre-order, wherever music is sold. You got to get it. Go buy it, because this is what we need. We need to support the music. Emilio, David, welcome to the show. Great to see you guys. How you doing? Thank you. Very well. Thank you. Good to be here. Yeah. Awesome. So talk about this album because, you know, it, it's a triple threat release. You're, you're getting the audio, you're getting the visuals. You know, I mean, all you're missing here is a, a multi-track of the thing and uh, you got everything. Uh, talk about the, ex you know, is it still exciting to go in and make a recording? Very exciting. Yes. Always. Yeah. You know, going back to 1968, let me ask you, and Mitch loves it when I get all technical. What's the biggest difference you've seen in recording technology? From back in the day to what technology is today? Well, the, the technology has just come so far. It's so vastly, you know, elevated from what it was. I mean, you can do anything now. Uh, you know, I, <laughs> and Dave is the same way. We're, we're nitpickers, you know. We like the stuff to sound exactly the way we want it to sound. Mm. And, uh, you know, back in the day, I remember doing the first record with David Rubinson and you know, I had never been in the recording studio. I didn't know nothing about it. And I remember, you know, I'd hear this trumpet. I'd be like, you know, we should redo that. You know, but no, no, he left it, you know. And I was like, <laughs> you know. and, uh, you know, uh, even uh, like a year and a half later, we were doing another record and immediately just started fixing things and, you know, molding things. And, you know, back then you'd have to cut tape and, you know, uh, send people in to redo over and over and analyze it and put the microscope on it. And, you know, it was a, it was a long process. Now you just go in and carve it up any way you want. Yeah. So, yeah. But let me ask you about that real quick, though. Isn't there a certain magic to imperfections? And it, it doesn't performance trump production where if you got a soul and a spirit, even if there's a, a bum note, you go, yeah, but it's got it's got that vibe. It's got that thing. Well, for us, for years, for us, for years, it was, uh, you know, the live performance in the studio. We did that a lot, you know, you, a lot of the rhythm section performances. I mean, if you listen to it, to like back to Oakland, you know, that, I mean, that's some really serious studio playing. I mean, and we were still really young, you know, so we didn't really have a lot of studio chops. It took us a while to get it, but you're hearing us it's not we were basically technology free i mean it, you know i think the most technology at that time was a tape splice i think that's the most technology that there was for us and then eventually we started using clicks a little bit but now we're all the way in you know with joe vanelli so he's kind of come you know all the way into today with mm -hmm. the way we do things yeah and now it's like you know you guys were now you just go into Pro Tools and you can program a horn section, whereas, you know, you guys were the original plug-in in a way. Producers would call you and say, hey, we need horns. Tower of Power. Calling those guys. Yeah, that one thing, though, they haven't really captured very well. I mean, it gets better and better, and it sounds, you know, to the to the untrained ear, people go, oh, those horns, you know, but there's something about live <clears throat> horns that's just hard to recapture with them. But I wanted to point out something, though, you know, that was part of the learning curve for us was we started getting all nitpicky and putting a microscope on it. And then we had to pull back and go, wait a minute, you know, we're, we're making it too analytical or making it too sterile. And so that's a fine line. Uh, I think it was Huey Lewis that taught me in the 80s. He said, you know, use all the technology there is, but don't let it use you. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Well, in fact, that's an interesting perspective. It is. And, and let me just uh, uh, take up on that because, and we've had this discussion before, but Huey Lewis is, is one of my bands. I mean, that's uh, just quickly talk to me about working with them and then going on, on the road with them because between Huey and, and the unsung hero, that is Johnny Cola, at least in my book. Um, right. I mean, jo Johnny's an unsung hero. Yeah. Absolutely. See? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just quickly talk to me about that, because he, here they are, they're doing sort of this big 80s MTV pop. Um, did you adapt to that or did you just add to their sound? And and just talk to me about Yui, because I can I could listen about Yui stories all day long. Me too. Well, anytime you do a horn section for anybody, we're there to compliment their band. We're not, you know, 
it's it's all about you know staying out of their way so that their stars shine you know uh we're always dismayed when we do a session and they insist that they do the arrangement you know and they come in and they got the saxes going ba da 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 you know but the guitar player who is the star of the show is going ba da 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 well guess who's going to get hurt in the mix it's mm -hmm. going to be the guitar player you know so you want to pick your shots with the horn so they stick out really good but don't step on everybody else and the thing with Huey Lewis was uh, for one thing they were unlike all the bands that were coming out then. You know, bands like Debo and the Motels and the, the Knack. That's what those were the kind of bands coming out at the time. Huey came out, they were a soulful band. I mean, the first song we did with them was Hope You Love Me Like You Say You Do. That was like a Bobby Womack tune. I mean, we were, I heard that song, I was like, whoa, these guys, they're pretty cool. You know, yes. well, you know, you're right about Johnny Cola. Johnny Cola. He's a big part of the way they sound. Man. Just he, vocally, their vocals always shine. And arrangement-wise, he, he was a big part of the Huey Lewis sound. What's amazing about you, and I'll get off of it because I know Jeremy has other questions, but when you look back, other than sports, they're very much, uh, I don't know, what do we call it? Like a, like a 50s band or a doo-wop? Like there, there's just a lot of soul and a lot of rhythm and a lot of, they're not a pop band at all. And it's just, it's, it's, I just love it. But uh, all right, Jeremy, let, yeah. let, I'll let you go from there. It's funny you say that because I feel like Huey and, you know, those guys, they, they really kind of transcend genres because they're not necessarily, like you said, a punk, a punk, a pop band or a rock band. It's like, you know, they're, they're taking multiple <clears throat> genres and creating a cool sound. You know, if, if you listen to like the Mutt Lang song, Do You Believe in Love? It's like there is the doo wop kind of backing vocals going on and, you know, the big drums and guitars, but is it pop? Is it rock? You don't really know. Talking about Mutt Lang, um, you know, through the years that you guys have done all these incredible recordings and guest appearances on these songs, what is it like going in and you, you kind of touched on it, you know, with the arrangements and stuff. How does it, a recording session work for you guys? You go in and you got this producer saying, all right, boys, so this is what you're going to do. You're going to record your hymns and that's it. Here's your part. Or do you, do you actually have to go in and write your parts and come up with a cool, catchy hook for the song that you're recording? Well, for us, we produce ourselves, so we're not answering to a producer per se. And these last two records, I worked with Joe Vanelli, but you know he was very much a team player. So you know, Dave can tell you more about the process because you know he's a big part of it. You know, he he and all the other guys. I come in with a vision for a song. I might say, "Here's the song, mm -hmm. and here's how I see it." You know, coming out. This is my vision for the tune, and then they start adding. Like Dave, go ahead, talk about that. Well, it's all, you know, just kind of from the ground up, start, you know, just creating, you know, we kind of, yeah. you know, making the stuff up as we go along. We've been doing that since the very, very beginning. And so, you know, everybody comes in, throws ideas in the pot and we come up with our stuff, you know, so it's very uh, free. It's very free. Um, nobody's looking over your shoulder telling you what to do. You just get to create. And so we build we've learned how to do it now so that it sounds pretty sophisticated, but you know, we're still mm -hmm. reaching, you know, and that's, I think the part, one of the parts of it that makes it so cool is that it's still super challenging. Uh, we get to be ourselves at all times. And, you know, Mimi brings in a song. Like for, I always think about on the serious side, because to me, that was one of the ones that was one of the uh, weirdest ones for me when I first heard it, he comes in the rehearsal and he says, hey, I got this idea. And he sings the line to Sirius Side. Speed up. Bump, bump. That was it. That was it. what he said. Okay, put something to this. Hello, the little, you know, bugs are flying out of everybody's ears. And, you know, <laughs> steam, steam coming out of everybody's head and everything, you know? Yeah. And we, and we just started... We just started carving and we just went for it. And that's what we ended up with. And a lot of our sessions are like that. Mm. And what? by the way, uh, uh, he mentioned Joe Vanelli and uh, Jeremy, you might like this. That's the brother of Gino Vanelli. And isn't oh, he, sure. isn't he uh, one of your manager's artists? Isn't he? Yeah. Aren't, aren't you? Yes. Yeah, Bar Barry deals with the Gino Vanelli a lot. So that's kind of cool. Right. So, so there's a connection. Your manager it manages the guy that's, who's the brother who makes their records. So there you go. That's Montreal cool. connection. Montreal connection. You can't beat that. Yes. I, I want to go back just really quickly and talk about, you know, the recording process. Cause you know, what's the biggest difference 
doing a recording session for a, another artist versus the Tower of Power? Is it the fact that, you know, you guys have full total control over your music? And when you're going into work with, like, say, a pop artist, do you have the producer kind of over your shoulder and saying, no, I want the horn section to sound like this. I want the horn part to sound like that. You know, talk about the, the differences there. And, you know, what, what kind of direction would a producer give you in that kind of situation? It's always a real pleasure to work with a producer that knows what he wants. Mm -hmm. And it's always a real tooth puller for somebody that has no idea what he wants, but <laughs> wants to hear every, you know, every sort of type of it that he can. You know, I remember doing right. sessions uh, years ago for a guy up in the Bay Area. I won't say his name, but, you know, he'd say, you know, I love it. The arrangement's great. Um, can I hear that with a fall? We go, yeah, you know, and we thought, you know, great, this is great. He knows what he wants, you know. And then he goes, now can you fall up? We go, yeah, you know. And he goes, can you make it short? Yeah. Can you make it long? Yeah. Can you, <laughs> can you, you know, pretty soon it's like we were there three days, you know. And, you know, he had an unlimited budget. We're working with this big artist. Yeah. You know, but, you know that that's kind of the difference, you know. And then there's the people that go, uh, the arrangement's great. Right there, I want this. He's not. He's not saying, what do you think? Or can I hear it like this? I want this. And we go, yes. And we give it to him. So if I could add to that, you know, the, the horn section does all the, set, the outside sessions. I mean, the rhythm section, really, we don't do that many of them. But there was one that we did that really is a standout to me because to me, it's one of Rocco's, you know, best performances ever. And it was a... a tribute album to james taylor sketches of james and we, we the whole band guested on it and it was the most unbelievable session uh we rehearsed for it uh the band i think that's one of the best recorded performances of the band even beyond some of our own our own stuff i think it's really outstanding because wow. it's tower all the way and he just let us be what we were but rocco that day when we rehearsed come up with all this really great stuff. We get to the session, Rocco forgets it all, typical Rocco style. And so <laughs> the producer comes to Mimi and he says, what is happening? What are we gonna do? And Mimi, Mimi does what he always does. He says, well, just never mind. It's gonna be cool. Just relax and it's gonna be great. Well, it ended up being exactly that. And it was it was just one of the really great great sessions. And that producer, Tim Weston, he knew what he wanted. That was one of the guys that knew what he wanted. And it was really, really great. The whole thing was fantastic. Right. That's interesting because, you know, if you're going to do a recording session for, you know, I was looking at the discography and you did stuff with Sammy Hagar versus, you know, going into working with Aerosmith, you know, if you listen to those later 80s albums, you know, they had the Margarita Horns, which was, you know, Bruce, the late Bruce Fairburn and all those great Canadian players. And then they come to you guys. So they have a history of some really awesome horn players. And, you know, I I think it's it's just so cool that, you know, you guys have had your mark on so many iconic and legendary artists. Yeah, that, was, that just sort of happened. We That wasn't a plan. We got a call one night from Nick Gravenites in the middle of the night. He said, uh, you know, I got this song, Funky Jim. We thought it'd be good with horns. Can you guys come over here? We're in San Francisco, <laughs> all the Eiders. And we went there and we, we made up some horn parts. It sounded really cool. He was really happy. And we walked out. He goes, here. He gave us some money. I mean, what's, this for? <laughs> what's this for? He says, we're coming in and playing. We go, oh, great, <laughs> thanks. You know, and it's like a month later, Santana called. And we did everybody's everything. And we're going... Oh, you know, so it just kind of happened. <laughs> it's always been about the band. It ain't about, you know, doing sessions for other people, but it just kind of morphed into that. Which, oh, which okay. is great. Uh, just quickly talk to me about, about the Bay Area and that sound. Because growing up, you know, I was influenced by the Sunset Strip sound of the 80s. And of course, then there was the Seattle grunge thing. And there's always a sound. But you look at the Bay Area from Sammy to Santana to Journey to Metallica to you know there's just something about the bay area um what green day green day yeah just t tons of them uh talk to me about the bay area sound and and what makes that that's that place so special because we we talk seattle we talk la we talk but we sort of seem to or we talk detroit but we sort of seem to forget sometimes san francisco and oakland 
That's ironic too, because that was the biggest movement of all. Yes. When the Bay Area yeah. caught on fire, when Bill Graham started off, there would be no Sammy Hagar, no Arena Rock. There would be none of that. Agreed. The Bay Area yeah. and Bill Graham had not happened. That's yeah. without it. Bill. The yeah. whole world exactly. looking at the Bay Area, and that changed everything. We yeah. had so many great players around here, so much great music, so many great bands. You In the early 70s, you could go out uh, any night of the week and go to the clubs and the hall, the concert halls, and you would hear music that you'd never heard before. You'd heard people creating in all genres of music. So there was great, there was the funk thing that which we really loved, which was East Bay, you know, Sly Stone and all that, you know. And then there was all the great rock, a lot of great rock music. There was Latin music. There was great jazz. There was everything here, classical music. So Tower Power was getting that in their ears every day. And so we were a product of all of that. The Bay Area was such a unique place. Huh. I mean, I think one of the most unique, it set the stage for the way that concerts and music is presented today. Bill was doing it way before he was the first guy. You could go to the Fillmore yep. and you would hear the Buddy Rich Orchestra with 10 years after and the Buddy Miles Express for four nights. Jeez. And it was unbelievable. So Bill was educating the public. He would have all these different kinds of bands, you know, cross genre bands yep. on a show and the kids would go nuts. The kids just oh. loved it. We loved it. It was just the way that music mm -hmm. was being presented. Bill was really, really smart. So it just seems like it was a really creative environment. Absolutely. Absolutely. It wasn't just no creative, way. Jeremy. It was the fact that there was no genres. Bill presented music. He didn't present yes. the new wave guy or he didn't present the punk guy. He presented music. And if five guys ended up in the city on the same night, he just stuck them on a bill and said, mm -hmm. go enjoy. And and I think because when you listen to bands that come out of the Bay Area, whether it's Yui, whether it's Journey, whether it's their music sort of hits everything. There's not just there's not a Yui sound. There's not a Santana. They're, they're sort of everywhere. And Mm. Right. That has a lot to do with, with Bill and the Fillmore. You know, we used to rehearse at Studio Instrument and Reynolds, downtown San Francisco. We had a rehearsal there, place there for a long, long time. And that was, and Mimi can tell you too, that was like ground zero for all the creative stuff that was going on. If we weren't rehearsing there, we were hanging out with somebody else who was rehearsing there. And all the bands had equipment, they'd store their equipment there, and all the bands rehearsed there. And it was unbelievable. And any day of the week, what was happening, those rooms were full of the Bay Area music musicians rehearsing, writing songs, going across the street, which was CBS Records, then became the Automat. They go back and forth across the street that was down there at Fourth and Folsom in San Francisco. It was this constant stream of creativity and great music going on. Mamie can tell you about all that. I mean, it was pretty unbelievable. I remember oh. one day we were rehearsing and I heard the Doobie Brothers were around the corner and I knew them, you know, so I was going to go around and say hello to them. But before I got to the room, I heard this really soulful singer, you know, and I was like, well, that's not the Doobies. I started to turn around, but then I heard the guitar and I went and I looked in and it was the first day that Michael McDonald sang with the Doobies at the rehearsal. Wow. That's the kind of stuff that was happening at Studio yeah. Wynn Reynolds. You know? That's great. Uh, Journey. That's what about Journey? Journey? Yeah, yeah would be over here, you know, uh, the new band called Rubicon, which was the horn players from Sly Stone was over here, yeah. Doobie's here, and Tower of Power over here. Wait, was Journey, Rubicon all... Journey started there as well, because remember the original Journey rehearsals, you know, with Ainsley Dunbar was playing drums, and, yeah. you know, Herbie Herbert was starting that band, and Herbie, we knew from Santana when he was a roadie with Santana. Yeah, absolutely. Jeremy's got a little technical issue that he's going to go uh, sort out. But let me ask you this, because I, I'm, I'm looking at your discography and I've got it in front of me. And, you know, you're looking Molly Hatchet over to Neil Diamond, over to Aerosmith, over to Jermaine Jackson, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Do you approach them all the same? Like your horns are your horns and they sound a certain way. Or do you have to adapt for the style of music where, OK, a hard rock band gets a different do you just go in and do tower power or do you have to really adapt in terms of what genre you're going to play for or play on? 
Well, a lot of that is, uh, you know, Greg Adams was our horn arranger for many, many years. Right. And now we have Dave Eskridge. And a lot of that has to do with the arranger talking with the producer or, or the artist or both. You know, they'll send the track and then they'll have a conversation and we want to hear their vision and you want to compliment that. But obviously we have a certain bag of tricks that we, you know, that we carry and we, you yeah. know, that's expanding as we go over the years. But, you know, we want to bring that to the plate if it works. It all has to do with complimenting the artist. You don't want to go in there and give them a track. I remember I, I worked with Stuart Levine. He produced uh, Simply Red and, you know, the Crusaders and one of these great producers, you know. And I remember him telling me, he said, you know, because if somebody walks away from my track going, man, those horns, he goes, I overdid the track, you know. Uh, uh. You know, and that's the truth. It's like, it's supposed to compliment the artist. By the way, and sp speaking of complimenting the artist, Jeremy and I are, are both friends with Steve Lucas here of, of Toto. Yep. Uh, and you've done some stuff with Toto. Just uh, um, give us some dirt, Emilio. What's it really like working with Steve? <laughs> well, I was going to, you know, the, 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 I wasn't working with him at the time, but uh, we spent a week together in Tokyo. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was, I was playing with Huey over there for a week. And, uh, and he was there, but he wasn't there with Toto. I think he was playing with a Japanese artist. And, oh. um, and man, there was some drinking and partying going on every night, you know. And, uh, and I remember seeing him in the mornings. And, and I look at him like, how are you doing? You all right? He goes, yeah, I'm going back to give it back. And I go, give it back? He'd say, yeah, you know, I'm going to the gym, man. I got to give it. In other words, I got to <laughs> <laughs> it's like a bank. <laughs> he recently came to uh, Phoenix. Uh, I live in Scottsdale, and so he, they were coming to town. And I was reading this book, you know, and I called up the promoter. I said, "Yeah, I'm going to come and say hello to Steve Lugather." And he calls me back. He goes, "He wants to see you." You know, and I go, "Oh, okay." You know, and I go down, and he comes in the room uh, after the show. There's all these people, you know, and they're all waiting for the guys to come in the room, you know. And he walks in, and you know, I just got married. You know, and my wife is like, uh, you know, how well do you know this guy? And I go, well, you know, I know him a little bit. And he walks in and he goes, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and Steve's guy. the best. Steve. By the way, the uh, the Gospel According to Luke is one of the best autobiographies you're going to read. It, it is just so good and so funny and 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 brutally honest. I mean, he doesn't. There's no sugar coating with that boy. Dude, huh? Steve's the best man. When I interviewed him, he was picking his nose in the video and everything. And I was like, <laughs> I'm right. That's how you do it. You know, no fucks given. <laughs> nope. Not with Steve. <laughs> Absolute greatest. Oh, I love it. Yeah. It's just so great. Well, listen, it's a triple threat release from the Funk Soul Icons Tower of Power, Bay Area Royalty. It's double DVD, double CD, triple, quadruple, everything, all that. 50 Years of Funk and Soul live at the Fox Theater. It's coming out on March 26th, so, you know, around a month from now, it's available wherever music is sold. Just to, to wrap up, boys, this was really cool to meet you and chat. Um, you know, just talk about this uh, this really cool triple vinyl, double CD, DVD that's coming yeah, out. I know. You're the big vinyl geek. I am the vinyl guy. Yeah, it's a, a long time in the making. We're fortunate. We're, we're with Mac Avenue Records. I don't know if you know about them, but they're kind of famous for their quality vinyl. They put out, you know, oh, regular really? vinyl, and then they put out the real high-end vinyl, you know. Yep. So we have this, uh, our, our, our vinyl recording of this particular 50th anniversary celebration is three vinyl discs it's a nice package you know so you got you got like three tracks on each side or what <laughs> we just got a lot of music you know, we played two long sets and we put it all wow. in so it, mm. it's, a, it's a lot of music and uh you know i've been working on it for the last couple of years and man it really came out good i'm so pleased with it you know and I, once again i just want to give a nod to uh your canadian counterpart you know joe vanelli yeah uh, dave garibaldi really is the one that you know, urged me to go check out Joe Vanelli over the years, many times. And, you know, I, I didn't do it. And then, you know, uh, it turns out he's married to our business manager, Diane. And uh, there's always a connection he, somehow. I know. And right. you're man, you're managed by the guy who, anyway, yeah. but yes. I was doing some recording and, and I was having a problem getting into that studio. And uh, she says, you know, Joe wants you to come in and do a couple of days with him. Well, my life changed at that point. He's so <laughs> particular. 
so creative, so musical. And he took me to the outer limits of my talent. I mean, he pushed me uh, harmonically. You know, he pushed me in terms of uh, taking chances that, and doing things I never would do, you know, and it, it took it to another level. And I did that with the two recordings, Soul Side of Town and Step Up. So now we go to the Fox Theater and we're doing a live concert, 50th anniversary celebration. It's a huge deal and he's involved with it, you know. And uh, so we've been working together on this and it was a long process, but man, it came out so good. I'm so pleased. So when did you-, you know, that that was, a, um, I think as, as a member of Tower Power, that's the hardest I ever worked as a member of Tower Power. We have a history of working hard. Seven days a week. I remember when we first started, we were rehearsing every day. Then we started touring. We'd come home from a tour. We would immediately be in the studio rehearsing the next day. Mm. And I think when I, my first marriage, Mimi gave me three days off. Go ahead, have fun. And I got three <laughs> days off, you know, for my first marriage. And uh, maybe that's why it didn't work out or something. I don't know. But <laughs> it's his this fault. Particular recording. <laughs> Damn it, Emilio. <laughs> <laughs> this this particular recording we rehearsed for it a week dedicated rehearsals then we would rehearse the material on sound checks on tour while we're touring so there was those rehearsals there was the gigs and then we would put the songs into the shows that we were doing so that we would get used to doing it we did that all the way up until we rehearsed even the day of the shows, 50th anniversary shows. We finally, the last day, we said, no, let's not rehearse. We're too tired. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, it's the hardest that I've ever worked as Tower Power. But we took, I think, our ability to work together to levels that is unbelievable for us. I mean, even it was... It was really something. It was just, we went to the mountaintop, stayed there, rarefied air, Mount Everest with the gas, you know, the masks on and all this stuff. I mean, it was so fun, you know, but we gave everything we had for it. So that's what people are going to be hearing when, and seeing when they watch the DVD and all that. Yeah. We gave everything, everything we had is Man. right there. That's amazing. Yeah. And I do want to mention one thing. The uh, full high-res digital album will be available for exclusive streaming and download on Cubits or Cubits or whatever on February 26th. So there's a little, there's a preview for people that have that. Yeah. yeah so people should also know, you know, we have a 10-piece string section. We have two extra background vocalists. You know, we had uh, Lenny Pickett on tenor and uh, Ray Green on trombone. So it's a seven-piece horn section rather than five. We augmented the band. We we blew it out in every direction, man. It, really came yeah. it sounds like it literally is a tower of power. It is. Well, you know, the 40th anniversary was like a jam session. We invited everybody. We made it available for everybody to come. And it ended up like that. It was really fun, you know, got to see everybody. And it was a big hang for a week or whatever we did. And, you know, but this one, we took it to a different level. We wanted to have, we invited people. We put together an orchestra, Mimi did. And we got the best people that we could, the best string players we could. We got selected guys and, you know, our history of, you know, we have an alumni association now. We should like Ohio State or something, you know. <laughs> and it was really, really an awesome, awesome experience being with all those people together like that. And you can hear it, man. It was not a jam session. It was an actual thing we did, which was made it even you know the Greater. next level it was great yeah yeah because yeah. there's a difference when you're just jamming versus actually you know yeah, sure. forming something together right. and, i just want to finish it with we had uh, chester thompson and we had bruce conti come in as well oh, and, wow you know all the, all, all the all the but let me ask you this is in terms and this will be my last question but when you change players is there an audition process do you go hey i know this guy he's real like how do you decide because yeah, how do you decide who's going to be the next, you know, horn player or whoever in Tower of Power? You you've gone through so many incredible musicians through the years. What's like what's like what are the qualifications to be in Tower of Power? Well, you got to know you got to know the concept, you know. And now, you know, fortunately for us because you know over the years we've, you know, gathered this 
you're, you know, renowned as it were, you know, people know our concept and are, you know, seeking to learn it. And so we can tell pretty easily now who's got it and who don't, but then we take them to what we call Tower Power 101, you know, <laughs> and uh, we take them on the road and we just, we school them. No, no, this is the way we do it. And we just, and, and you know, and we, we still do that with each other every night. I and mean, when we come off the stage, I'm immediately going, you know what, at the bridge right there, that note right there, we need to, you know, we're always chipping away at the sculpture. That's just how we do it. Yeah. Where'd you go to school? I went to Tower Power U. I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Tower you know, Power State. True. You know, everybody says, you know, you got musicians that come in and say, oh, I love you guys. I listen to you all the time. Right. I've played your music. Well, being in it and being outside of it is two different things. The way we interpret, you know, everything's got to be precise and north, notes that usually would be a little bit longer in Tower Power, they're a little bit shorter. We have a way that we interpret our music. And, you know, you got to know it. You got to yeah. get in there inside of it. And you have to be happy to or feel free within a structure because we do a lot of the same music all the time. And with, you know, there's form in our music. Everybody's got a role in it. And so it's this organized thing. And if you're not comfortable within a structure, Tower Power is not for you. You know, some guys are not like that. Some guys really, yeah. we've had fabulous players who are not comfortable in that kind of an environment, you know, but if you are, man, this is the place to be. <laughs> yeah. And I guess there is a difference between, you know, listening to the music and being able to actually perform it. You know, somebody comes in, thinks it's a quarter note, but really it's a dotted eighth or, you know, they come in and they play. Have you ever been in that scenario where someone said to you, oh man, I love the tunes. I grew up loving it and playing it. And then they audition and they were just terrible. Yeah. Well, you know, there, there, there's a lot of what you call tower power clone bands. now. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll be on the road. We'll be checking into the hotel, you know, <clears> at about, you know, 1030 at night and we'll hear in the in the other in the lounge you know they're playing a bastardized version of down to the nightclub you know just <laughs> murdering it you know and then you know people will hear oh the tower power's checking in you know they'll come out yeah we do your tunes man we got them down man yeah, yeah, yeah. he's a garifaldi freak man you know <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, at the end of the day, I'll be honest with you. Mitch doesn't know the difference between an oboe and an elbow. So he's the last That is true. <laughs> but I know, <laughs> but I know good music. Up, and uh, over the years, uh, Sammy, Yui, and all those guys that, that the tower have been involved or helped out or whatever played on. Yeah. Thank you. All well, I'm, all, made it better. Tell you me know what? It. They have a phrase. Shoemaker, stick to thy last. <laughs> That means you give good interviews, so just give good interview. <laughs> there you, you go. <laughs> 50 Years of Funk and Soul, live at the Fox Theater. It's out on March 26th. Go pre-order it. Do it. Just get it in your life. Tower of Power. Emilio, David, this was so great. It was so cool to a meet pleasure. you. Legends, and a, thanks for the pleasure. music. Thank and... you for having us. You're yes, welcome. Thank you. Guys. Good to meet you. Cheers. And yes, finally get to see you instead of always just being on the phone. <laughs>